set us off introducing ourselves a little bit from, uh, again, moving away from football and more into the business and organisational side of Norwich. Um, so, James, can I ask you to introduce yourself sure. first? Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, so I'm, I'm James Hunter. I'm a partner at uh, Mills and Reeve, which is a, a law firm. Um, we've uh, got a thousand, just, well, over a thousand people now, spread across six cities uh, in the UK. Um, just to kind of, should I just give you, a, so, so just to, to headline the kind of approach that we're trying to take to our own culture, I suppose, was to, um, you know, go through that exercise of trying to capture it in some kind of message. And for us, that's <clears throat> achieve more together. And, uh, and, and what we've found is that that, for us anyway, encapsulates what we think is quite a collaborative culture, sort of inclusive and collaborative collegiate is the other word that we use all the time, um, uh, uh, and really speaks about the way we want to work with well, what we want to achieve for ourselves as a business, we just want to achieve more together. We want to work with our clients and then with our people. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm... Is working okay? Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Um, uh, my name's Sarah, Sarah Barrow. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor of Arts and Humanities here at UEA. So welcome to everybody here. Um, uh, I'm also the executive team lead for Equality and Diversity. Um, and I've been leading on the, sort of the people and culture agenda, but with a lot of colleagues. And I'm really delighted that many of those colleagues are here tonight. It's really great um, because we've got some fantastic leadership um, uh, in the university uh, in the right areas now. Um, as Laura mentioned at the beginning, we've been building on our motto of do different with a new values exercise. It's not to say that our university, which is now kind of 60 odd years old, hasn't had values. It's just that they kind of need refreshing, <coughs> reinvigorating and rethinking and actually made to work. Um, so we're doing a do different, do together exercise now, as Laura mentioned, and um, we're just uh, hopefully going to uh, have, a, have a little bit of a chance to, to rethink where our values are and how we then embed those in the organisation. So uh, that's our current main piece of work around people and culture. Thank you. James. Thank you. So yes, I'm James Sesser. I'm head of people at Naked Wines, and some of you may have just uh, tried out some of the wine. Um, in terms of culture, um, I kind of want to be saying actually what he said. Um, so much resonates in terms of um, our approach to, to people. Ultimately, we want to be a really successful business and we know that successful businesses take culture seriously. It's important, it really is, it's about the people. So for me, being on this panel um, is, is a, an opportunity to, um, you know, to discuss a topic that I'm very excited about um, with others that are hopefully equally as excited. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm Fiona Ryder, I'm President of the Norfolk Chamber of Commerce, um, I'm also the Senior Independent Director down at Ipswich Building Society, I know it's in Suffolk, um, and um, I, I have a business called TCD Media and I'm MD of that as well. Um, and um, I think it's been a very interesting journey over the last couple of years at Norfolk Chamber in particular. Um, most of you here will be aware that we had a change of Chief Exec, I'm pleased to say he's in the room, he should be here really rather than me. But, um, uh, and I think, you know, when Chris first joined, um, one of the first things that we looked at is how do we change the organisation. Um, it's been a real privilege to be on the board for a number of years, but also to um, start looking at how we might modernise quite an old-fashioned, in many ways, um, institution, something that, you know, has 122 years of history. And that brings a different cultural challenge, perhaps, than... Uh, some sort of more modern businesses. So we've got to try and move it forward uh, for the 21st century, but not lose some of the, um, uh, the key cultural values. Um, so I think one of, the, one of the issues for all of us has been looking at you know, internal language and looking at, I mean, if brand is your sort of external marketing um, element, then in culture is very much your internal brand. And, you know, I think what Stuart was saying earlier about um, making sure everyone's speaking the same language is one of, the, one of the first things that we started to address and making sure that everyone knows what we stand for, where we're going, and that you haven't effectively got somebody practically speaking, you know, Chinese in one side of the room and sort of, man, you know, I don't know, Japanese over the other. I think it's been um, a really interesting process. And people don't realise how important sort of internal language is. So um, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, and I think it's a very exciting and essential topic, actually, for our competitive advantage as a county. 
So I think one of the things that where we can bridge from football, where competitive advantage can be seen every weekend on the on the pitch or o over the course of a season, um, in businesses we also have a competitive advantage based on the cultures that we build and the cultures that we promote and the things that we want to work on. So I'd love for each of you to share a little bit about um, the competitive advantage that you feel that your um, organisation can benefit from from the investments that you make. And James, would you? start with talking about Naked Wines and the, some of those advantages that you get from that investment? Absolutely. I think, you know, when we're talking about building a, building a culture, a positive culture where people want to be part of uh, what you're creating and uh, aspire to, to help you to, um, to reach your goals, then they tend to talk about it. Now, when they're talking about it with their peers, um, with their families, whoever it is, they're talking about it in a positive light and, hey, that's that's free press. We all know that. It's, you know, it's pretty straightforward. But for a local organisation that relies upon um, employing locally and re relies as well upon a, a talent pool that, um, that isn't always that broad or that big, then having that kind of competitive advantage is, is crucial. It's essential. Thank you. James, would you share about Other some James? of the advantages? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> James, James. <laughs> No, don't well, share, share all those views. I mean, I think so. One thing we're doing at the moment is um, uh, a whole pro, you know, kind of writing another strategy, but we're in the middle of that at the moment. And um, a, a, as a big part of that, we're speaking to lots of our clients or businesses that we don't act for, but we're just interested in what they think about the world and, and using professional advisors and, and so on. And um, the, the really interesting thing around the scoring that we're getting back so we're asking them to score what's important to them about the people that they deal with. And the three top ranking responses are diversity and inclusion. Is, is, you know, I can't remember quite how these three are ranked, but the top three are diversity and inclusion together. Um, some kind of demonstrable um, CSR or, or purpose, you know, purpose that is that they can relate to and, and, and feel comfortable with. Uh, and then the third one is some kind of people accreditation. And those are the, you know, when you give them a whole choice of factors for all kinds of organisation in all sorts of different you know, roles and walks of life. Those are the three things that are coming out with. So around people accreditation for us, it, it's definitely, you know, we feel it's a differentiator and, and, and being able to articulate it and have all of your people articulate it in a way that's kind of sounds real and convincing and not contrived. And um, Stuart spoke a bit about that, which I thought was really, really important, is that people, you know, in, in all places need to be able to recognise what it is that keeps them together whilst celebrating all the other sort of things that make them all very, very different. And that's what you're trying to do. Um, and we, we certainly find it's a you know, competitive advantage, uh, I think. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> there's loads of great lawyers out there. But I mean, so, you know, we've been in this thing, the Sunday Times Top 100. They do a list of top employers. And we've been in that for, for 16 years running. And no other organisation has been in it for 16 years running. So it's, it's a great external validation. And... and you know, clients respond to that because they kind of assume I can do the law. You know, that's just, a, it's just, you know, it's the cliche, isn't it? But it's just a given. So it's about what is it that's different. And then around recruitment, but you'll come on to that later, I'm sure. <laughs> um, talking about equality and diversity as a competitive advantage, and it's something that I'm also really passionate about. Um, and as the, um, that's one of the focuses that you have in your role, can you talk a little bit about what that means for the university? Yeah, so obviously as a university, our business is people. Um, you could say our business is uh, are the students, but actually the students, as much as we hugely value them, of course, um, they come and they go. Uh, and the staff, hopefully, come and stay. Um, so that's our business, really, is, is, is thinking about how we attract and retain and develop and support the best talent. Um, and we really believe that the work around equality and diversity that will include working with our students and obviously listening to views and working in partnership, but really uh, looks at how we address issues. Uh, and we have certain frameworks within the higher education sector that we can address. We have to be very careful that they are more than tick box exercises and that they are genuinely embedded. Um, and that's a bit of a journey that I have to say we're, we're kind of embarking on as the next phase of our, our plan. Um, but we have, uh, we have uh, frameworks around um, gender where uh, that's really crucial, not just as a nice to do, 
but it's something that we, we really strengthens um, our work around research. If we can show that we've got a great research environment that thinks carefully about how we're treating all types of people, then we will do better and we will continue to be in the top 200 in the world rankings. So, and that reflects well on the whole university and hopefully on the city as well. So we're kind of thinking carefully about that commitment. So we had frameworks around gender, um, uh, uh, around we have uh, links with Stonewall and their framework and right now we're embarking on the race equality charter work um, we would have loved to have got on with that earlier um, so we've got lots to learn there but we've got a massive commitment from uh, the vice chancellor the students union everybody to seeing um, how far we can push that work um, again, not because it's nice to do, but because the more diverse voices we can have informing the work that we do, the better, more productive, more exciting, more attractive that work will be. So that's where we're heading. But we've got lots to do. Um, James, I want to come back to you to talk about, um, we had discussed in, in a conversation before this about for you, the culture isn't just internally, it's also to do with your suppliers and your sort of community that you're building a little bit beyond the business. Absolutely. So for us, um, building a community of not only um, angels, our customers, um, building a community internally um, in the workplace, but also building a community of who really we're, we're serving. And, and the, the main sort of, um, the main goal for, um, for our business is actually to help independent winemakers um, to get a fair deal, um, to stay doing what they're really passionate about and what they're good at, and to, um, to bring customers to them um, in a way that doesn't rip anyone off, basically. So by treating them in exactly the same way as we treat our staff and our customers and bringing them along for the journey, we, um, we, every year we get together and, and jump on a coach. There's about 40 winemakers 40 staff, and then we go and hit 10 different, um, 10 different towns or cities um, over the UK. It gives us an opportunity to, to all get together, to see each other face to face, and to, to, to actually be, um, uh, be a family, to, to, to feel that sense of, yes, similar values, similar um, aspirations in terms of the goal that we're trying to achieve. And I think as an online business in particular, it's so important to, um, to facilitate something like that where we're getting together face to face. So yeah, building a community isn't just internally, it's, it's understanding that there are, you know, whether it's departments within a workplace or there are customers, there's, there's different groups that can, can still be very much part of your community. And broadening out for that community to the business community across the county, um, I guess Fiona, you're in a very unique position of meeting a lot of different types of businesses yeah. and having a different viewpoint than some of us who are in the business community but not necessarily seeing it. So I wonder if you have anything to share about some of that. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, obviously as Norfolk Chamber, one of our missions is to give a voice to every business in, in Norfolk, but it's also to make our message heard outside of the county. And I think we perhaps view um, Norfolk as a collective whole in terms of, you know, the, the business community and what perhaps we can offer to other people outside of Norfolk. And I think, you know, what we want to do is to really create a positive culture here, ideally, and encourage people to look at changing their own internal cultures to um, ensure that we're attracting the right talent to come into the county, um, that we're retaining some of the brilliant students that are here from UBA and, and newer, um, and we have sort of less of a, a sort of migration down to London post-graduation. We want Norfolk to be a brilliant place for people to live and work. And in order for us to, uh, to really become uh, a destination of choice, um, I think we really have to look at you know, what it perhaps means to be an employee working for an in Norfolk business. Um, what are we going to do to make, um, you know, the, the average, what, 90,000 hours or roughly thereabouts of the third of what your working life you spend at work? How are we going to make that a great experience here? And I think, um, you know, I think we all recognise there's probably quite a lot of work to do. Um, we have got some fairly old paradigms of the past um, to perhaps consider. And forgive me for this, for the, the, the men in the room, but, you know, we do have propensity towards pale, stale and, and, and male <laughs> in Norfolk. And I'm really sorry. I'm not saying that's everyone, but I think, you know, we, we need to look at that. And going back to what, you know, Sarah was saying about diversity, why is that still the case in the 21st century? Um, and, and what do we need to do to change that? 
Um, and I know that's probably deeply controversial, and I hope we're under Chatham House rules. We don't have tweets going out, the president <laughs> says. So, um, you know, I'm sorry. Um, but I, I think, actually, um, for all of that, I think Norfolk is a fabulous place. I don't come from Norfolk, and perhaps I also have, therefore, a different perspective um, and, and what the county means to me now and, and what it's like um, outside. And, and Norfolk is a fantastic place. Um, there was, um, we actually talked about the Norfolk Charter recently and we launched it at the Norfolk Enterprise uh, Festival. Um, and, you know, that is really trying to um, uh, garner businesses and um, create a new sort of manifesto for Norfolk that says we want this to be a brilliant place, we want this to be a destination of choice, we want every single business here to be the sort of company that somebody really wants to come and work for. Um, because if we can attract the best and the brightest, then that's brilliant for our local economy. And I think it has to start with some cultural change. I want to come back briefly to recruitment, which you mentioned um, yep. in passing, that I think for all of us in business, we know the, the power of having a very strong culture it helps recruitment in lots of different ways. So did you want to share a little bit about your experience? Well, um, yeah, well, I suppose it's just, again, I'm sure we all probably find this. I mean, it's, it's, it's really competitive. So again, I think, I think having a, a well-articulated um, ethos or culture around your organisation helps you, first of all, attract people who like the sound of it, but it also helps you sort of you know, measure those people against your own, your own values. And again, Stuart was saying, you know, it's not about wanting to recruit everybody in, in your own image, but what it does allow you to do is kind of nudge behaviour a bit, and, 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 and that, is in, <coughs> that includes when you're recruiting. So you can have the... You know the person who you you've got a really good instinct is going to be, you know, awesome at what they do, but just culturally very very difficult to fit in. And I think if you if you have maybe quite a lax view of culture, then you might just be relaxed about that and make make the gamble, roll the dice, and 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 do real damage to something that's really valuable in the organisation. So it forces you to make some really quite difficult decisions sometimes to turn opportunities away or or business away or or people away. Um, without being inhibited in the way that you develop your business, but just measuring what you're doing against what you know is your culture and what people value. Because otherwise, you'll, you, you know, there's a, there, I think there's a danger you just, you just rub it out over time. So, yeah, so all the external benchmarks and everything are great, but I think the, the, the challenge we find, and it is a challenge, I'm sure we get it wrong some of the time, but the challenge we find is, is always checking our decisions against what we know to be our uh, kind of culture, really, and making sure we're comfortable with that. Um, Did you have anything to add about recruitment? I know you have quite an intense uh, induction process that you... We do, and I think, yeah, you make some really important points in terms of, you know, once you've created a culture, for example, there's a responsibility to, to everybody else in that environment to, um, to, to maintain it and to bring in the right people that are going to help us to, to move forwards and to grow. Um, so I certainly feel that, that weight of responsibility, and we... At Naked, we've created um, an onboarding tool, basically, called, called a bucket list. We have a, a group of volunteer buddies um, who are really passionate about our values and um, passionate about helping people to, to live them as, as best they can. Um, the bucket list itself has a list of different experiences that we'd like people to, um, to, to go through in their first month. Um, and many of those experiences help them to understand what our culture is all about. It uh, helps us to observe whether the culture um, and that individual are a good match. And, you know, often in, a, in an interview, um, you don't quite discover whether or not they're a good fit. You might have a gut feeling. Um, and we're always told that potentially that's not the, the, the best thing to, to go on. Um, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But for us, that, that month gives them an opportunity to kind of test drive us, gives us an opportunity to have a look at them. And then at the end of that month, we, we, have, a, um, we have an interview um, with one member of, of staff that then at the end of it offers the opportunity for that person to leave the business with three months' salary. And often that's, that's offered and the jaw hits the, hits the floor and, oh. really? You're going to give me three months' salary to leave? Um, absolutely, because if that's all it takes for the wrong person to disappear quietly, then that's money well spent. Wow. Amazing. Wow. 
Chris, are you listening? As a small business, I'm sort of trying to do the math. That's amazing. That's amazing. Wow. It used to be one month, but no one's taken it yet. (laughs) (laughs) So how many people have taken three? None yet. Oh, wow. (laughs) Good. Um, I'd like to move on to talk a little bit about the, some of the challenges that we face as we try to address culture in our organisations. And I think, um, you know, Stuart mentioned about uh, we don't always get it right. We go in with ideas of things. I'm talking about myself here. I, anyone who was here at the previous um, Culture Shock event that we did had me do a talk about everything that I got wrong. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we, we go into um, building culture with the very best intentions and... Um, for our journey at Fountain, it started with realising that we had a great group of people and we needed to grow and we wanted to retain something. And so we worked really, really hard to put things in place to retain something, but that doesn't always work and things do go wrong. So I'd love, um, if you guys are happy to, to share some of the challenges that you come up against. And if you don't mind me starting with the <laughs> largest of the organisations on the panel here. <laughs> so oh, we, have, like we have read. no challenges, of course we do. Um, yeah, as, as a rather enormous multifarious organisation that's very fluid in many ways in its structures, and you know we have a very autonomous in many ways body of academics, that's how academic life works, and then a very different kind of way of perhaps working, more structured way within our professional services. We have lots of subcultures. And so we have different expectations and we have, I guess, challenges around, and this is a journey that we're really embarking on with our values work, around developing a sense of what are we as a UEA community, our community. One thing that's already coming through, no surprise, but it's, you know, it's good to sit there in black and white, is that one of the um, things we need to work on, uh, and we're seeing this in our online conversation at the moment, is trying to, if not eradicate, then at least kind of diminish the sense of them and us. And that's not just executive team and everybody else, but all sorts of them and us situations going on. And trying to think about um, not saying the university, but how are we going to take collective responsibility for things that are going right or going wrong? It's a massive thing to do, but it's really something we must do if we're going to sort of move forward into the next phase. And as we, if we, if we are as we are, committed to further growth, um, then we need to think about how we're going to take more people uh, along with us on on that journey, so to speak. Um, So I think our biggest challenge is trying to acknowledge, appreciate, um, and respect the different cultures. We don't want a kind of a homogenous body. It's great having so many different kind of vibrant communities on campus, but also think about how we can bring everybody together. Um, at the moment, for example, we do have, because we, we haven't refreshed our values for quite some time, we've got different pockets of the university who've developed their own sets of values. And while that's okay, <laughs> it does mean that when it comes to, well, what does our organisation stand for? What are people coming to? Who are they working for? There are challenges around that. I hope that's not speaking out of term, Chatham House <laughs> rules and all of that. But I think, you know, that seriously is something that we are um, we're, we're kind of um, wanting to, uh, to make better. Thank you. Uh, well, I wrote down a whole... I thought you might ask that. So I wrote down a whole list of challenges, actually, but we haven't got time for a whole, whole list. So I thought... Well, so one I would come up with that's relevant to our kind of an organisation is around pay and rations, really. So the... the, the you know, kind of really difficult thing to do is, well, sorry, two things because they're interrelated, not confuse a kind of, in our case, collaborative, inclusive inclusive culture with a low performance culture. So it's trying to make people recognise that we're about high performance in that kind of environment. And that's, that's a mixed message if you don't get it right. And related to that is how you reward people because it's quite easy to reward on some metrics, you know, numbers are, are easy. Hours, 90,000 is a bit grim, but hours, if you, you know, is, is, is a metric, isn't it? But trying to find the right measurement to then reward the people who are doing what you want them to do is difficult when they're not purely financial or input type metrics. And that, and that you know, we found that and still find that really, really, really difficult to do. Well, just one really quick example. So one thing we, we, we do, which is a bit different, is we have a really flat bonus structure. You know, we're quite, we, you know, deliberately so, and we test it every year with our... Um, staff and uh, because it pays so it's about a, last year it was a million and a half of profit that we shared equally to every member of staff with every member of staff getting exactly the same amount so a thousand people it's about 1500 so that is not a you know to some people that's not that isn't a spectacular amount of money in their world they just think well that's great but it isn't you know 
you know, great. Um, but of course, to some other people in the organization, think about apprentices or people who are working in all sorts of different roles, it's, it's, it's a holiday with the family or it's some, it's some real difference to them. And we test this every year and, and you sometimes get some pushback from some of the kind of, you know, kind of uh, out there hungry lawyers saying, well, I want more bonus, you know, give me a... And, but, but actually, the, the huge majority of people say, you know what, we really like the fact the firm does this. And we, you know, we really like the fact that we can look at everybody who's working with us on that day of the year and they've all just been paid exactly the same amount of money, which is a d d directly driven by the profitability of the firm. Um, and, and it's a real tension because it, it's a, you know, some people just don't respond to that, but you have to just you know, pay your money and take your choice. Do you have any of your challenges to share? Um, challenges, yeah, we've had plenty, um, and perhaps mistakes when it comes to, to culture. Um, a good example, perhaps, is when we moved into the US market. So we launched in, in America um, probably about five, six years ago. And I think there was a, probably an arrogance in terms of, right, we've, we've nailed this business model. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's working wonders. We've, um, we've got 200,000 uh, customers, angels, paying in a, in on a, a monthly basis. People get this, and we can just move it over to the US, and it's, it's going to work. What we didn't... What we... I think we didn't, well, we probably understood it, we just ignored it. We, um, we didn't realise that culturally, America's very different to the, to the UK. Um, and that applies to customers, it applies to staff, big time. So when we took you know, a load of, of UK um, people that were very excited about moving over to, uh, to Napa Valley, um, with the with the almost the um, the expectation that they were going to just go and implant this culture and this uh, business proposition that was going to work, it didn't, did it? And it took us about two years to understand um, that it was so different and there's a very different identity that we needed to create in that market. So, you know, I think complacency um, is important to, to to keep at bay and um, continually thinking about culture and, and asking the questions to get the feedback from those that are in front of you, whether it's customers or staff, is vital. Thank you. Did you have any? Yeah, I think, I think in terms of challenges, um, I think there's two that I'd probably like to mention. And I think one is, for some of the smaller businesses in the room, it's if you're looking at actually in implanting culture or developing culture for your business, the one thing that always comes up is cost. Um, and I think people sometimes are really nervous about, you know, expending additional money on developing something which they see as a cost. Um, but I think uh, there are so many different ways of approaching it. Um, I mean, like, I know that Lift Chair, for instance, if they've got a big problem and they want the staff to, or to think about it and think about how they might resolve it, they go for a walk. So, you know, it costs absolutely nothing, but how lovely is that actually to say come on we're going to go and really debate this problem and have a chat about it and everyone feels included and it's different and it's out of the office and it actually costs no money whatsoever um, and you can't always um, reward people financially particularly if you're you're growing a business from scratch and it's still relatively small so you have to think creatively about what else you might do so I think one of the big challenges is to get out of the mindset that money is always the benefit and the bonus. And actually, if you do develop a strong culture, there's loads of research out there to show that people actually value it as much as a pay rise, pretty much. Would you agree with that? Yeah. So I think that that's, that's one thing for me. And I think the other thing, just to pick up on, on your point, James, about cultural alignment, um, I'd just like to share one anecdote. I, I sold a, a business in London uh, before I moved up to Norfolk. And um, I'd fully expected to stay in the business after I sold it, which I now retrospectively <laughs> very naive. Um, so it's analogous to um, uh, selling your house to some new owners and living in it at the same time is what it's like. <laughs> um, and what I hadn't appreciated was the importance of cultural fit. And we'd looked at everything. We'd had due diligence. We'd had lawyers crawling over everything for six months. Everything looked great. Uh, you know, we'd had lovely meetings and dinners and the boards had got together and it all looked brilliant. And then when the deal was done and um, I suddenly found myself plunged into a new working environment with effectively a new boss, which was interesting for my staff too, we suddenly realised that the one thing that I'd missed was culture. 
And actually, I couldn't stay, and I struggled with it for 18 months, and eventually I had to leave because it was, I was having to watch you know, a culture that I'd developed be completely um, rearranged, effectively, completely ruined by the new owners. You know, my staff, um, for instance, uh, enjoyed shorter working hours every single week. And then you suddenly realise that the people up the road in a different department, different part of the business, are working an extra five hours. Uh, how do you resolve that? Do you suddenly put your staff salary, you know, or their staff salaries up um, or cut um, hours? You can't, you just can't do that. And I think, you know, that was the first time I'd really, I know it sounds very ridiculous, but I really thought about the importance of cultural alignment. And I think the one thing that I would say for Norfolk businesses, I think we also need to think about cultural alignment when you're choosing suppliers, actually, as well. Um, I think it's essential that your supply chain, effectively, as businesses, share some of the values that you do. Um, and if you, if you do that, you will find that, I think, overall, that you will be able to provide a better service to your clients and customers. So I think those are the big three things that... Are, I think we should be focusing on. Thank you so much. And that leads me on to just our, sort of the final question that I want to put to everyone is about some of those practical investments that can be made in culture because it, we can, it can all sound a bit fluffy. It can sound a bit uh, sort of idealistic. It can, we can be talking about putting words on walls, for example. And I think for especially for smaller businesses or businesses that are going through a moment of change, um, just any practical advice about how to address culture in in a practical way. Can I start with you? Yeah, so I, th I think, um, <clears throat> yeah. So, I th well, I think an investment in time would be uh, an investment really well spent. So, I, so, again, an example, I said to you, we're in you know, six different locations. So that's, you haven't had time to talk about it, but that's another challenge with culture. You know, you know, US and UK, it's not as extreme as that, but it's very different places within the UK. Um, but one thing my, so my managing partner does, so the, the CEO of our organisation does, is she, um, she meets every single new person who starts with the firm without fail. And uh, she might not do it the week they join, but she schedules that in and she will meet every single new starter. And I think there's something about closeness to management that really matters. If you want to create, in our case, quite a flat structure, sort of not very hierarchical. I think where people respond is if they feel quite close to the management of that organisation. The only way you can really do that is invest quite a bit of time. To, to, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, I was going to say time as well. I think that's super important. Um, but just uh, for UEA, I think we have such a fantastic environment that what we've been thinking about more recently is how we can make better use of our campus, our physical campus, and investing in our space. And I don't mean our buildings, but our actual beautiful environment. We kind of, we, we walk through it and we take it for granted. So recently we've set up a really kind of cross um, university group called Active Campus. My colleagues is on that as well. And we're thinking about that from a wellbeing point of view. We're investing time, money in specific initiatives um, uh, sort of way marking, signposting, so really using that which we already have to better advantage. So it's about just some, I guess, some creative quick thinking. We're working really closely with our student body on that. And again, it's, it's recognising the talent that's already there. Um, uh, and, and I think going back to what Fiona was saying, it's not costing so much. Um, and it's amazing what sources of money there are out there that will help us um, ge generate some really good ideas. So I think it's our environment that, that I would, and I would just really recommend, look at, look at what's around you. Do, do that bit first. Yeah, for me, I guess it's, it is investing time. But for, for Naked Wines, it's about asking questions. It's about involvement. It's about you know, getting as much feedback and, and really talking about culture so it's part of the conversation. Uh, we, do, we do surveys on a quite a regular basis. They're not these big you know, 40, 50 question surveys. They're just, you know, we use Slack, so we just ping out a few questions every so often and we get feedback. It means that people feel like they've got a voice because they have got a voice and they're informing the culture. They can, they can steer us in one way or, or another. They can, you know, they can reject an idea or they can express their, their feelings about something that, that isn't perhaps going their way. And that in itself is important in a culture. So you know, whether it's being honest or admitting to a mistake, we're not all gonna agree on everything. We might have similar values, but we're not all gonna agree on anything. So if we're gonna have if we're going to work effectively together, we need to get that out there. So that, for us, is, is really important. 
Yeah, I think, I think we've kind of almost <laughs> covered everything. Um, uh, I think the other thing is um, just focusing on attitudes, and that is all the way through the business as well, in addition to all the other points that have been made. There is no point, uh, if you've got a disconnect in attitude between senior management and you know, perhaps other people in the organisation, that's where you get problems. And I think sometimes organisations are quite keen to say we're changing the culture. Um, and I'm delighted to hear what you were saying, James, about your bonus scheme. But the people in the, you know, the executive might have a different view and might behave somewhat differently. So it's all well and good saying this is, this, these are our cultural values. You have to practice what you preach. And I think, therefore, attitudes throughout the business have to be aligned. And it goes back to language again. You know, is everyone speaking the same language in your organisation? Or have you got one person that really just doesn't understand what somebody else is talking about? Um, and I th think going back to the Norfolk Chamber, you know, we are really have done a huge amount to make sure that the customer comes first and our members come first. Um, and that's a sort of new language that de we're developing um, throughout the organisation. And, you know, I think sometimes there are some people that don't, perhaps don't quite get it. Um, and it has been quite difficult to start saying, actually, attitudinally, you need to come along with us on this journey. Um, so that would be my big one. Thank you so much, and thank you to all of you for taking part in the panel.